2,000 calories, to get those same 2,000 calories from strawberries themselves, you'd have to eat 44 cups of berries, right? That's 11 stomachfuls. I mean, as delicious as berries are, I don't know if I could fill my stomach to bursting 11 times a day, right? So some foods are just impossible to overeat. They're so low in calorie density, right? You just physically couldn't eat enough to even maintain your weight. In a lab, a calorie is a calorie, but in life, far from it. Traditional weight loss diets focus on decreasing portion size, but these, you know, we know these eat less approaches can leave people feeling hungry and unsatisfied. A more effective approach may be to shift the emphasis from restriction to positive eat more messaging of increasing intake of healthy, low-calorie density foods. But you don't know until you put it to the test. Very nice. Researchers in Hawaii tried putting people on more of a traditional Hawaiian diet with all the plant foods they could eat. Unlimited quantities of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and the study subjects lost an average of 17 pounds in just 21 days. Calorie intake dropped by 40%, but not because they were eating less food. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food in excess of four pounds a day. How could that be? Because whole plant foods tend to be so calorically dilute, right, you can stuff yourself without getting the same kind of weight gain. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food. That's why in my upcoming new book, How Not to Diet, which I am very excited about, <clears throat> that's why low in calorie density is on my list of the 17 ingredients for an ideal weight loss diet. Uh, as noted before, uh, Americans appear to average about three pounds of food a day, so if you stuck with mostly these foods, right, you can see how you can eat more food and still shed pounds. A landmark study set to be published next month found that even when presented with the same number of calories and the same salt, sugar, fat, fiber, and protein, processed foods led to weight gain, uh, two pounds gained over two weeks, and unprocessed foods led to weight loss, two pounds down in the same two weeks. Here's one of their processed food meals, which is probably healthier, actually, than what most people eat. Non-fat Greek yogurt, baked potato chips, sugar-free diet lemonade with a turkey sandwich has the same number of calories as this, with the unprocessed meal food folks were eating, a kind of a Southwest entree salad, black beans, avocados, uh, nuts. So that's the calorie density effect. Same calories, but there's just more food. No wonder it satisfied their hunger, and they ended up four pounds lighter in two weeks eating more food. So how can you decrease the calorie density of your diet? Well, just a quick peek at the two extremes should suggest two methods. Abandon added fats and add abandoned vegetables. Method number one, covertly put people on a relatively low-fat diet. They tend to lose body fat every day, even though they can eat as much as they want. But if you instead give those same people the same meals, but this time sneak in enough extra fats and oils to change it to a high-fat diet, they gain body fat every day. In fact, in a famous prison experiment in Vermont, lean inmates were overfed up to 10,000 calories a day to try to experimentally make them fat. This turned out to be surprisingly difficult. Most started dreading breakfast and involuntarily threw it up. The Researchers learned how difficult it was to have people gain weight on purpose unless you feed them lots of fat. To get prisoners to gain 30 pounds on a regular diet, it took about 140,000 excess calories per a certain amount of body surface area. To get the same 30-pound weight gain just by adding fat to their diets, all they had to do was feed them about an extra 40,000 extra calories. When the extra calories were in the form of straight fat, it took as many as 100,000 fewer calories to gain the same amount of weight. A calorie is not a calorie. It depends on what you eat. In this case, 
lowering fat content effectively made up to 100,000 calories disappear. That's why low in added fat is on my list of ideal weight loss ingredients as well. There are, however, two important exceptions. Processed foods with reduced fat claims are often so packed with sugar that they can have the same number of calories as a higher fat product. Right? Snack wells, fat-free cookies, for example, at 1,700 calories per pound, are as calorie-dense as a cheese danish. The other exception to the low-fat rule is that vegetables are so calorically dilute that even a high-fat veggie dish, like some you know, oily broccoli with garlic sauce or something, tends to be less calorie-dense overall, which brings us to the second strategy for lowering calorie density. Instead of sneaking out fat, sneak in vegetables. The biggest influence on calorie density is not fat, but water content. Since water adds weight and bulk without adding calories, the most calorie-dense foods and the most calorie-dense diets tend to be those that are dry. Some vegetables, on the other hand, are more than 95% water, and not just you know, iceberg lettuce. Cucumbers, celery, turnips, cooked Napa cabbage, bok choy, summer squash, zucchini, Bean sprouts and bamboo shoots can top out at 95% water. They're basically just water in vegetable form. Right? A big bowl of water-rich vegetables is practically just a big bowl of trapped water. Right? The effect on calorie density is so dramatic the food industry wants in on the action. They figured they could use nanotechnology to structure a solid processed food similar to a celery stock with self-assembled water-filled nanocells or nanotubes. No need as Mother Nature beat you to it. <laughs> when dozens of foods common foods pitted head-to-head -head for their ability to satiate appetites for hours. The characteristic most predictive was not how little fat or how much protein it had, but how much water it had. That was the number one predictor of how filling a food is. That's why high in water-rich foods is on my list too. Water-rich foods like vegetables, topping the charts, was most more than 90% water by weight, followed by most fresh fruit, coming in around the 80s. Starchier vegetables, whole grains, and canned beans are mostly 70s, meaning three quarters of their weight, pure water. In general, when it comes to water-rich foods, most whole plant foods float towards the top, most animal foods uh, fall somewhere in the middle, and most processed foods sink to the bottom. In a famous series of experiments, researchers at Penn State decided to put water-rich vegetables to the test. Study subjects were served pasta and told to eat as much or as little as they'd like, and on average they consumed about 900 calories of pasta. Now, what do you think would happen if as a first course you gave them 100 calories of salad, uh, composed largely of lettuce, uh, carrots, cucumber, celery, and cherry tomatoes? Would they go on to eat the same amount of pasta and end up with a 1,000 calorie lunch, 900 plus 100? Or would they eat maybe 100 fewer calories of pasta, effectively canceling out the added salary, uh, salad calories? It was even better than that. They ate more than 200 fewer calories of pasta. Thanks to the salad, 100 calories in, 200 calories out. Right? So in essence, the salad had negative 100 calories. Preloading with vegetables can effectively subtract 100 calories out of a meal. Right? That's how you can lose weight by eating more food. Of course, the type of salad matters. The researchers repeated the experiment, this time added a fatty dressing, extra shredded cheese, which quadrupled the salad's calorie density. Now, eating this salad as a first course didn't turn a 900-calorie meal into one with less than 800 calories. Instead, it turned it into a meal with calories in the quadruple digits. Right? It's like you know, preloading pizza with garlic bread. Right? You can end up with more calories overall. OK, so what's the cutoff? Studies on preloading show that eating about a cup of food before a meal decreases subsequent intake by about 100 calories. So to get a negative calorie effect, 
the first course would have to contain fewer than 100 calories per cup. Right? As you can see in the chart, this includes most fresh fruit and vegetables, but you know, having something like a dinner roll would not work. But hey, give people a large apple to eat before that same pasta meal, and rather than consuming 200 calories less, it was more like 300 calories less. So, how many calories does an apple have? It depends on when you eat it. Before a meal, an apple could effectively have about negative 200 calories. You can see the same thing, giving people vegetable soup as a first course, hundreds of calories disappear. One study tracked people's intake throughout the day, even found that overweight subjects randomized to pre-lunch vegetable soup not only ate less lunch, but deducted an extra bonus 100 calories at dinner too, a whole seven hours later. Right? So the next time you sit down to a healthy soup, you can imagine calories being veritably sucked out of your body with every spoonful. Even just drinking two cups of water before a meal immediately caused people to cut about 20% of calories out of the meal, taking in more than 100 fewer calories. No wonder overweight men and women randomized to two cups of water before each meal lost weight 44% faster. Two cups of water before each meal, 40%, 44% faster weight loss. That's why so-called negative calorie preloading is on my list of weight loss boosters, which are all the things I could find that can accelerate weight loss kind of regardless of what you eat the rest of the time. Negative calorie preloading just means that, uh, that starting a meal with foods containing less than 100 calories per cup, that can include many fruits, vegetables, soup, salad, or simply a tall glass of water. Anything we can put on that first course salad to boost weight loss even further? Well, in my AMPing AMPK section, I talk about ways to activate an enzyme known as the fat controller. Its discovery is considered one of the most important medical breakthroughs in the last few decades. You can activate this enzyme through exercise, fasting, and nicotine, but is there any way to boost it for weight loss without sweat, hunger, or the whole dying a horrible death from lung cancer kind of thing? Well, Big Pharma is all over it. After all, obese individuals may be unwilling to perform even a minimum of physical activity, wrote a group of pharmacologists, thus indicating that drugs mimicking endurance exercise are highly desirable. So it's crucial that oral compounds with high bioavailability are developed to safely induce chronic AMPK activation for long-term weight loss and maintenance. But there's no need to develop such a compound since you can already buy it at any grocery store. It's called vinegar. When vinegar, acetic acid, is absorbed and metabolized, you get a natural AMPK boost. Enough of a boost to lose weight at a typical dose you might use dressing a salad? Well, I mean, you know, vinegar has evidently been used to treat obesity for centuries, but only recently has it been put to the test. Randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial on the effects of vinegar intake on the reduction of body fat in overweight men and women. The subjects were randomized to uh, drink a daily beverage containing one or two glasses, uh, one or two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, or a control drink, um, uh, a beverage that developed to taste the same uh, but, uh, as the vinegar drink, but prepared with a different kind of acid, so it didn't have any actual vinegar in it. Three months in the fake vinegar group actually gained weight, as you know, overweight uh, people tend to do, whereas the genuine vinegar groups significantly lost. Body fat is determined by CT scan. A little vinegar every day led to pounds of weight loss achieved for just pennies a day without removing anything from their diet. That's why one of my 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss is two teaspoons of vinegar with each meal, either sprinkled on your salad or even just added to tea with some lemon juice or something. The beauty of the vinegar studies is that they're not just randomized controlled trials, but placebo controlled trials. I mean, some studies aren't controlled at all. Right? 
Women asked to eat a ripe tomato before lunch every day for a month, lost about two pounds, but without a control group, you don't know if the tomato had anything to do with it. Just being enrolled in a weight loss study where you know they're going to come back and weigh you in a month can have people change their diets in other ways. Right? I mean, it's certainly possible. I mean, tomato is 95% water, so uh, you'd be filling up a fist-sized portion of your stomach with only about 15 calories before a meal. So, I mean, it's certainly possible, but we'd need a better study to prove it for weight loss. Stronger studies have control groups, at least. For example, randomized people to a weight loss diet with or without one to two cups of low-sodium vegetable juice, and those drinking the vegetable juice lose significantly more weight. Or split people into two groups and give half about two tablespoons of goji berries a day, and 45 days later the goji group appeared to cut two and a half inches off their waistline compared to no change in the control group. But any time you have one group do something special, you don't know how much of the benefit is due to the placebo effect. In drug trials, it's easy. Right? You give people the, half the people the actual medication, the other half a placebo, identical-looking sugar pill placebo. Both groups are, are then doing the same thing, taking an identical-looking pill. So if you see any difference in outcomes, all right, well then we can suspect it's due to the actual drug. Right? But what would placebo broccoli? look like, right? That's the problem. You can't stuff cabbage into a capsule, but there are some foods so potent that you could actually fit them into a pill to pit them against placebos, spices. Want to know if garlic can cause weight loss? Give people some garlic powder compressed into tablets versus placebo pills, and garlic worked, resulting in both a drop in weight and waistlines within six weeks. They used uh, about a half teaspoon of garlic powder a day, which would cost less than four cents. Four cents too steep, how about two cents a day? A quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day, about 100 overweight men and women randomized a quarter teaspoon worth of garlic powder a day, or placebo, and those unknowingly taking that two cents worth of garlic powder a day lost about six pounds of straight body fat over the next 15 weeks. Now, if you can splurge up to three cents a day, there's black cumin, a meta-analysis of randomized control trials, shows weight loss efficacy again with just a quarter teaspoon a day. Not regular cumin. This is a completely different spice known as black cumin. You say, well, what is black cumin? You obviously haven't been reading your Bibles. Described as a miracle herb, Besides the weight loss, there are randomized controlled trials showing daily black cumin consumption significantly improves cholesterol and triglycerides, significantly improves blood pressure and blood sugar control. But I use it just because it tastes good. I just put uh, black cumin seeds in a pepper grinder, grind it like pepper. With more than a thousand papers published in the medical literature on black cumin, some reporting extraordinary results like dropping cholesterol levels as much as a statin drug. Why don't we hear more about it? Why weren't we taught about it in medical school? Right? Presumably because there's no profit motive. Right? Black cumin is just a common natural spice. Right? You're not going to thrill your stockholders selling something that you can't patent that costs three cents a day. Or you can use regular cumin, the second most common popular spice on earth. Those randomized a half of a teaspoon at both lunch and dinner over three months, uh, lost four more pounds and an extra inch off their waist, found comparable to the obesity drug known as Orlistat. Uh, that's the uh, anal leakage drug you may have heard about. Though the drug company evidently prefers the term fecal spotting to describe the <laughs> rectal discharge it causes. The drug company's website offered some helpful tips, though. It's probably a smart idea to wear dark pants and bring a change of clothes with you to work. You know, just in case a drug causes you to crap your pants at work. I think I'll stick with the cumin. <clears throat> 
cayenne pepper can counteract the metabolic slowing that accompanies weight loss and accelerate fat burning as a bonus. Ginger powder, over a dozen randomized controlled trials, starting at just a quarter teaspoon of ground ginger a day, sowing significantly decreased body weight at just pennies a day, proven in placebo-controlled trials to work, but you probably never heard about any of this because they can't make enough profit. Don't get me started. <clears throat> Let me go back to the Coke versus carrots example. A calorie is not a calorie, because drinking this is not the same as eating this. But even if you consume the same number of calories, chewed for hours to pack in all those carrots, a calorie may still not be a calorie, because it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. And as anyone who's ever eaten corn can tell you, some bits of vegetable matter can pass right through you. A calorie may still be a calorie circling your toilet bowl, but flush calories aren't going to make it onto your hips. Right? <laughs> That's where fiber comes in. If you bump people's fiber intake up, even to just the recommended minimum daily intake, they start losing weight because they experience about a 10% drop in daily caloric intake. Why should more fiber mean fewer calories? Well, of course, first it adds bulk without adding calories. Cold-pressed apple juice, for example, is basically just apples minus fiber, and you could chug that, you know, chug a bottle of juice in a couple of seconds. But, I mean, to get the same number of calories, you would have to eat about five cups of apple slices, and that's the difference fiber can make. But it's not just a calorie density thing. Imagine what happens next. Right? The, the apple juice would get rapidly absorbed as soon as it spilled out of your stomach into your gut. Right? Spike your blood sugars, whereas the sugar trapped in the mass of chewed apple slices would be absorbed more slowly along the length of your intestines. Right? Nutrients can only be absorbed when they physically come in contact with the side of your intestine, with your gut wall. Right? Um, now, fiber never gets absorbed, right? so it can act as a carrier to dilute or even eliminate calories out the other end. And fiber doesn't just trap sugars, it acts as a fat and starch blocker too. Those on a standard American diet lose about 5% of their calories through their waste every day, but on a higher fiber diet we double that. It's not what you eat, but what you absorb. So you can lose weight on a high-fiber diet eating the exact same number of calories, simply because some of those calories get trapped, get flushed down the toilet, and never make it into our system. And it's not just the calories in the high-fiber foods themselves that are less available. High-fiber foods trap calories across the board. Right? So eat a Twinkie on a high-fiber diet, and you absorb fewer Twinkie calories. It's like every calorie label you look at gets instantly discounted when you're eating lots of fiber-rich foods, which is why it makes it onto my list. My section on other fat-blocking foods starts out with a command to eat your thylakoid's doctor's order. What on earth is a thylakoid? Just the source of nearly all known life and the oxygen we breathe. No biggie. Thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place, the process by which plants turn light into food. Thylakoids are the great green engine of life, microscopic sac-like structures composed of chlorophyll-rich membranes concentrated in the leaves of plants. When we eat thylakoids, when we you know, bite into a leaf of spinach or something, those green leaf membranes don't immediately get digested. They last for hours in our intestines, and that's when they work their magic. Thylakoid membranes bind to lipase. Lipase is the enzyme in our body that our body uses to digest fat. So if you bind the enzyme, you slow fat absorption. But if all the fat is eventually absorbed, I mean, what's the benefit? Location, location, location. There's a phenomenon known as the ileal break. The ileum is the last part of the small intestine before it dumps into your colon. And when undigested calories are detected that far down in your intestines, your body thinks, oh, I must be full from stem to stern, and puts the brakes on eating more by dialing down your appetite. This can be shown experimentally. You insert a nine-foot tube down people's throats and drip in any calories, fat, 
sugar, uh, protein, and you can activate the ileal break. Um, uh, so then you sit them down to, uh, to an all-you-can-eat meal, and compared to the, the placebo group, who had just gotten a, a squirt of water down the tube, um, uh, people eat about 100 calories less, right? You just don't feel as hungry. You feel just as full uh, eating significantly less. That's the ileal break in action. This can then translate into weight loss. Randomize overweight women on a diet to green plant membranes, in other words, just covertly slip them some powdered spinach, and they get a boost in appetite-suppressing hormones, a decreased urge for sweets. Yes, indeed, spinach can cut your urge for chocolate. And boom, accelerated weight loss, all thanks to eating green, the actual green itself, the chlorophyll-packed membranes in the leaves. Now, the researchers use spinach powder just so they can uh, create uh, convincing placebos, but you can get just as many thylakoids eating about a half a cup of cooked greens, which is what I recommend people eat two times a day in my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy things I encourage people to fit into their daily routine. In the Journal of the Society of Chemical Industry, a group of food technologists argue that given their fat-blocking benefits, thylakoid membranes could be incorporated into functional foods as a new promising appetite-reducing ingredient, or you can just get them the way Mother Nature intended. Which greens have the most? You can tell just by looking at them. Because thylakoids are where the chlorophyll is, the greener the leaves, the more potent the effect. So go for the greenest green greens, the darkest green greens you can find. Um, where I shop, that's the lacinato, aka dinosaur kale. Now, if you overcook greens too long, right? You know how they turn that drab olive brown? That's the thylakoids physically degrading. But blanched for 15 seconds or so in steaming or boiling water, you know how greens can get even brighter green? That actually translates into a boost in the fat blocking ability. So you can gauge thylakoid activity in the grocery store, in your kitchen with your own two eyes by going for the green. Though thylakoids eventually get broken down, fiber makes it all the way down to our colon. While it's technically true that we can't digest fiber, that's only applicable to the part of us that's actually human. Most of the cells in our body are bacteria, or gut flora, which weigh as much as one of our kidneys, as metabolically active as our liver, has been called our forgotten organ. And it's an organ that runs on MAC, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Uh, so when you see me write, you know, eat lots of Big Macs, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. Um, MAC is just another name for prebiotics, right? What our good gut flora eat, in other words, fiber. There's that fiber again. What do our good bacteria do with the fiber? We feed them, and they feed us right back. They make short-chain fatty acids that get absorbed from the colon into our bloodstream, circulate through our body, and even make it up into our brain. Right? That's like the way our gut flora communicates with us, dialing down our appetite, um, all the while um, increasing the rate at which we burn fat and boosting our metabolism at the same time, all thanks to fiber. Check this out. Put people on a brain scanner, show them a high-calorie food like a donut, and the reward centers in their brains instantly light up. But if you repeat the experiment, but this time secretly deliver fiber-derived short-chain fatty acids directly into their colon, you get a blunted reward center response. And subjects report that high-calorie foods just seem less appetizing, and subsequently ate less of an all-you-can-eat meal. But fiber supplements like Metamucil don't work, uh, which makes sense because they're non-fermentable, meaning our gut bacteria can't eat them. So yeah, they can improve uh, bowel regularity, but can't be used by our good bacteria to make those compounds that can block our cravings. For that, we have to actually eat real food. Our good gut bugs are trying to help us, right? But when we eat a diet deficient in fiber, we are in effect starving our microbial self. Less than 5% of Americans 
reach even the recommended minimum daily adequate intake of fiber. No surprise, since uh, the number one sources are beans and whole grains. And 96% of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum intake of legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, and 99% don't reach the recommended minimum for whole grains. Most people don't even know what fiber is. More than half of Americans surveyed think that steak is a significant source of fiber. However, by definition, fiber is only found in plants. There's zero fiber in meat, eggs, or dairy, and typically little or no fiber in processed junk, and therein lies the problem. But I mean, wouldn't at least the protein in that steak fill you up? Surprisingly, even a review supported by the meat, dairy, and egg industries acknowledged that protein intake does not actually translate into eating less later on, whereas you eat a fiber-rich whole grain for supper, and it can cut your calorie intake more than 12 hours later at lunch the next day. You feel full 100 calories quicker the following day because by then your good gut bugs are feasting on the same bounty and dialing down your appetite. Today, even our meat could be considered junk food more. For more than a century, one of the great goals of animal agriculture has been to increase the carcass fat content of farm animals. Take chicken, for example. 100 years ago, the USDA determined chicken was about 23% protein by weight and less than 2% fat. Today, chickens have been genetically manipulated through selective breeding to have about 10 times more fat. Chicken little has become chicken big, and maybe making us bigger too. Meat consumption in general is associated with weight gain, but poultry appeared to be the worst. Even just an ounce a day, which is like a single chicken nugget, or like one chicken breast every 10 days, was associated with weight gain compared to eating no chicken at all. Uh, you know, it's funny, when the, uh, when the meat industry funds obesity studies on chicken, they choose for their head-to-head -head comparison foods like cookies and sugar-coated chocolates. This is a classic drug industry trick to try to make your product look better by comparing it to something worse. Apparently, just regular chocolate wasn't enough to make chicken look better. But what happens when chicken is pitted against a real control, like chicken without the actual chicken. Chicken, chicken's out. Both soy-based proteins and corn, which is a, a plant-based meat made from the mushroom kingdom, were found to have stronger satiating qualities than chicken. Feed people a chicken and rice lunch, and four and a half hours later, they'd eat 18% more of a dinner buffet than had they instead been given a chicken-free chicken and rice lunch. These findings are consistent with childhood obesity research that found that meat consumption seemed to double the odds of school children becoming overweight compared to the consumption of plant-based meat products. Whole food sources of plant protein, such as beans, did even better, though, associated with cutting in half the odds of becoming overweight so that's why I consider uh, these kinds of plant-based meats more of a useful stepping stone uh, towards a healthier diet rather than the kind of end game goal ideal. Part of the reason plant-based meats may be less fattening is they cause less of an insulin spike. Uh, a meat-free chicken like corn uh, causes up to 41% less of an immediate insulin reaction. It turns out animal protein causes almost exactly as much insulin release as pure sugar. Just adding some egg whites to your diet can increase insulin output as much as 60% within four days, and fish may be even worse. Why would adding tuna to mashed potatoes spike up insulin levels but adding broccoli instead cut the insulin response by about 40%. It's not the fiber, since giving the same amount of broccoli fiber alone provided no significant benefit. So why does animal protein make things worse, but 
plant protein make things better? Plant proteins tend to be lower in the branched chain amino acids, which are associated with insulin resistance, the cause of type 2 diabetes. You can show this experimentally. Give some vegans branched chain amino acids, you can make them as insulin resistant as omnivores, or take some omnivores and put them even through a 48-hour vegan diet challenge, and within two days you can see the opposite. There's significant improvements in metabolic health. Why? Because decreased consumption of branched chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Check this out. Those randomized to restrict their protein intake were averaging literally hundreds more calories a day, so they should have become fatter, right? But no, they actually lost more body fat. Restricting their protein enabled them to eat more calories, while at the same time they lost more weight, more calories, yet a loss in body fat. And this magic protein restriction, they were just having people eat the recommended amount of protein. So maybe they should have just called this group the normal protein group, or the recommended protein group, and the group that was eating more typical American protein levels and suffering because of it, the excess protein group. Given the metabolic harms of excess branched-chain amino acid exposure, leaders in the field have suggested the invention of drugs to block their absorption, to promote metabolic health and treat diabetes and obesity without reducing caloric intake. Or we can just try not to eat so many branched-chain amino acids in the first place. They are found mostly in meat, including chicken and fish, dairy products, and eggs, perhaps explaining why animal protein is associated with higher diabetes risk, whereas plant protein appears protective. So defining the, the appropriate upper limits of animal protein intake may offer a great chance for the prevention of type 2 diabetes and obesity, but it need not be all or nothing. Even an intermittent vegan diet has been shown to be beneficial. If there was one piece of advice that sums up the recommendations in my upcoming book, it would be wall off your calories. Animal cells are encased only in easily digestible membranes, which allows the enzymes in our gut to effortlessly liberate the calories in a you know, steak, for example. Right? Plant cells, on the other hand, have cell walls that are made out of fiber, which present an indigestible physical barrier, so many of the calories remain trapped. Now, processed plant foods, however, fruit juice, sugar, refined grains, even whole grains, if they've been powdered into flour, have had their cellular structure destroyed. Their cell walls cracked open, and their calories are free for the taking. But when you eat structurally intact plant foods, chew all you want, you're still going to end up with calories completely surrounded by fiber, which then blunts the glycemic impact, activates the allele break, and delivers sustenance to your friendly flora. So, bottom line, try to make sure as many of your calories as possible, your protein, your carbs, your fat, are encased in cell walls. In other words, from whole intact plant foods. That's what nature intended to happen. Millions of years before we learned how to sharpen spears and mill grains and boil sugar cane, our entire physiology is presumed to have evolved in the context of eating what the rest of our great ape cousins eat, plants. The Paleolithic period, when we started using tools, only goes back about two million years. We and other great apes have been uh, evolving since back in the Miocene era, more like 20 million years ago. So for the first 90% of our hominoid existence, our bodies evolved on mostly plants. It's no wonder, then, that our bodies may thrive best on the diet we were designed to eat. So maybe we should go back to our roots. <clears throat> With enough portion control, Anyone can lose weight. Right? Lock someone in a closet, you can force them to lose as much body fat as you want. Chaining someone to a treadmill, 
probably have a similar effect, but what is the most effective weight loss regimen that doesn't involve calorie restriction or exercise or a felony? I scoured through the medical literature at all the randomized controlled trials, and the single most successful strategy to date is a diet of whole plant foods. The single most effective weight loss intervention like that ever published in the peer-reviewed medical literature, a whole food, plant-based diet. That works better than anything else studied to date, and no wonder, given what we just learned about fiber and branched chain amino acids and all that. Okay. Now, I, I mean, we've known for more than 40 years that those eating predominantly plant-based diets weigh, on average, about uh, 30 pounds less than the general population, but you don't know if it's the diet itself until you put it to the test. In 2017, a group of New Zealand researchers published the broads a 12-week randomized controlled trial in the poorest region of the country with the highest obesity rates. Overweight individuals were randomized to receive either standard medical care or semi-weekly classes offering advice and encouragement to eat a low-fat diet centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And that's all it was, just empowerment, and information, empowerment with knowledge, no meals were provided. The intervention group was merely informed about the benefits of plant-based living and encouraged to uh, fit it into their um, own lives at home. No significant change in the control group, but the plant-based intervention group, even though there were no restrictions on portions, be able to eat freely all the healthy foods they wanted, lost an average of 19 pounds by the end of the three-month study. 19 pounds, that's sort of kind of respectable weight loss, but what happened next? Right? At the end of those 12 weeks, class was dismissed, and no more instruction was given. Uh, the researchers were curious uh, to see how much weight the subjects had gained back after being released from the study, so everyone was invited back at the six-month mark to get reweighed. Uh, the plant-based group had left the three-month study 19 pounds lighter on average, but you know, six months later, they were only down about 27 pounds! They got better! The plant-based group had been feeling so good, both physically and mentally, had been able to come off so many of their medications, that they were sticking to the diet on their own, and the weight continued to come off. What about a year later? Even in studies that last a whole year, where people are coached to stay on a particular diet for the entire year's time, by the end of the year, any initial weight loss typically tends to creep on back. The prod study only lasted three months, yet after it was all over, those who were, had been randomized to the plant-based group not only lost dozens of pounds, but they kept it off. They not only achieved greater weight loss at 6 and 12 months than any other comparable trial. That was months after the study had already ended. Right? A whole food plant-based diet achieved the greatest weight loss ever recorded compared to any other such intervention published in the scientific literature. You can read the record-breaking study yourself for free in full at nature.com slash articles slash NUTD2173, um, or you can just point your phone camera up at the screen and pick off the QR code. Any diet that results in reduced calorie intake can result in weight loss. I mean, dropping pounds isn't so much the issue. The problem is keeping them off. Right? And a key difference between plant-based nutrition and more traditional approaches to weight loss is that people are encouraged on plant-based diets to eat ad libitum, meaning as much as you eat as much as you want. No calorie counting, no portion control, just eating. Right? The strategy is to improve the quality of the food rather than restricting the quantity of the food. You put people on a diet packed with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans that allow them to eat as much as they want, they end up eating about 50% fewer calories than they might have otherwise, just as full on half the calories. Uh, wait, how can you keep people satisfied cutting more than 1,000 calories from their daily diet? By eating more high-bulk, low-calorie density foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and fewer calorie-dense foods, like you know, meats, cheeses, sugars, and fats. Right? But it may not just be the calories in side of the equation. Those eating more plant-based appear to effectively be burning more calories in their sleep. The resting metabolic rate 
of those eating more plant-based may be 10% higher or more, a boosted metabolism that can translate into burning off hundreds of extra calories a day more without doing a thing. Eating more plant-based, you burn more calories just existing. So no wonder why those who eat more plant-based tend to be slimmer. Start packing your diet with real foods that grow out of the ground, and the pounds should come off naturally, taking you down towards your ideal weight. Okay, so that's what I spent the first half of the book doing, laying out the optimum weight loss diet, plant yourself. Then I spend the second half of the book on all the tools I unearthed to drive further weight loss for any stubborn pounds that remain. We already learned that a calorie is not necessarily a calorie. 100 calories of chickpeas right, has a different impact than 100 calories of chicken or chicklets based on factors like absorption and appetite. But in this second half, I go a step further and explore how even the exact same foods eaten differently can have different effects. Even if you eat the same amount, even if you absorb the same amount, a calorie may still not be a calorie. It's not only what we eat, but how and when. Just to give you a taste, the exact same number of calories at breakfast are significantly less fattening than the same number of calories at dinner. What? I mean, that's just mind-blowing, right? Same calories, different weight loss. A diet with a bigger breakfast causes more weight loss than the same diet with a bigger dinner. So my recommendation to stop eating after 7 p.m. is not just because you know, I'm afraid people are mindlessly snacking on the couch or something. The same snack at night is literally more fattening than eating the exact same snack during the daytime. All thanks to our circadian rhythms, our chronobiology, something I uh, spend a whole chapter about. Some of the Sleep data is really crazy, too. Overweight adults were randomized to eight weeks of either a calorie-restricted diet or the same diet combined with five days a week of just one less hour of sleep a night. Now, they ended up sleeping an hour later on the weekend, so overall just got three hours of sleep out of their week. Now, surely, I mean, it's got three hours a week of sleep difference is not going to change how much weight they lost, right? And on the scale, that was true. But in the normal sleep group, 80% of the weight loss was fat, whereas in the group missing just a few hours of sleep, it was the opposite, with 80% of the loss being lean body mass. Right? So, you snooze, you lose fat. Right? A few hours of missed sleep seemed to totally flip fat loss on its head, but just looking at the scale, you wouldn't know it. It's like when people fast. Stopping eating completely for a week or two can cause more weight loss than just restricting your calories, duh, right? But paradoxically, it may actually lead to less loss of body fat. Uh, wait, how can eating fewer calories lead to less fat loss? Because during fasting, your body starts cannibalizing itself and burning your own protein for fuel. The scale made it look as though they were doing better when they were fasting, but the reality is they were doing worse. They would have lost more body fat if they had kept eating. They would have lost more body fat eating more calories. Right? Short-term fasting can interfere with body fat loss, not accelerated, and you see the same thing with the keto diet. Body fat loss actually slows down when you switch to a ketogenic diet. Just looking at the bathroom scale, though, the keto diet seems like a smashing success, losing less than a pound a week on a regular diet to boom, three and a half pounds in seven days after switching to keto. But what was happening inside their bodies told a totally different story. On the ketogenic diet, their rate of body fat loss was slowed by more than half. So most of what they were losing was water, but they were also losing protein. They were also losing lean mass. That may help explain why the leg muscles of CrossFit trainees placed on a ketogenic diet can shrink as much as 8% within two months. Of course, even if 
keto diets work, the point of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket. Right? <laughs> People whose diets even tend to trend that way appear to significantly shorten their lives. On the other hand, even just drifting in the direction of eating more healthy plant foods is associated with living longer. Right? Those going the other way, though, those who start out more plant-based but then add meat to their diet at least once a week, not only appear to double or triple their odds of diabetes, stroke, heart disease, and weight gain, but may also suffer an associated 3.6-year drop in life expectancy. That's going from no meat to just once a week meat or more. Low-carb diets, have been shown to impair artery function and worsen heart disease, whereas whole food plant-based diets have been shown to actually reverse heart disease. That's what Ornish used. Right? So it appears to be the most effective weight loss diet just so happens to be the only diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients. Right? My grandma didn't have to die like that. Yeah, no one's grandma has to die like that. If that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women. Shouldn't that be kind of the, the default diet until proven otherwise? And the fact that it can also be so effective in treating, arresting, or reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Only one diet has ever been shown to do all that, a diet centered around whole plant foods. You, you don't have to mortgage your health to lose weight. The single healthiest diet also appears to be the most effective diet for weight loss. After all, permanent weight loss requires permanent dietary change. I mean, healthier habits just have to become a way of life. And if it's going to be lifelong, you want it to lead to a long life. Thankfully, the single best diet proven for weight loss may just so happen to be the safest, cheapest way to eat for the longest, healthiest life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greger, for joining us today. That was a very powerful presentation. So it's I'm, good I'm to actually, be here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Well, glad to have you. I'm actually a very big fan of your work, and I watch and share your videos all the time. So uh, now we're going to begin our live Q&A. We're going to be opening up questions to the audience. I'm going to first ask a few questions, and then we'll, we'll open it up to them. And uh, for people who want to ask a question, please raise your hand by going to the bottom of the Zoom window. Second from the right, you'll see a reactions button and you'll click on that and then you'll select raise hand from there. So um, my first question um, I wanted to ask you about is um, in our next speaker's book, Sickened, Dr. John Abramson from Harvard Medical School's clinical faculty talks about how the peer reviewers of articles in peer reviewed journals do not necessarily have access to the source material that a study's conclusions are based on, and instead do their review based on the conclusion of the authors of the study along with the design structure of the study. Is that correct? And to the extent that it is, how do we ensure the veracity and validity of peer reviewed studies? And how does that fact impact how you interpret these peer reviewed studies? Yeah, that can be a problem. Uh, data transparency is critical. Um, and oftentimes, uh, particularly with drug trials, um, there's some kind of proprietary shield over kind of participant level data. Um, and so you have kind of compiled statistics, um, which are presented in the paper, but you don't actually see kind of the original raw data. And the concern is when there is kind of a, a commercial influence, there's a, funding, a potential for funding bias. The concern is maybe they're sweeping something under the rug, that never made it to the final paper. Maybe they're kind of ignoring outliers. Maybe they're, you know. Uh, so you always want as much data transparency as possible. Thankfully, uh, many of the major journals now demand it. So you really can, I mean, if you want to get uh, published in some of the top tier journals, which um, many of these companies want to do because they want to put their results in front of the, uh, you know, the scientific community in the best light. Uh, so they're forced 
to really uh, uncover um, and basically, you know, give their raw data, present their raw data, not only sometimes to the peer viewers, but actually accessible to the public as well. I mean, you can go um, and, you know, you can you can go to kind of the online version of the article and actually download the Excel spreadsheets yourself. And that allows kind of amateur sleuths across the Internet to be like, wait a second, that looks a little fishy. Why do all your and there's interesting um, statistical models that you can run on raw data to, to see if someone made up numbers. It's really crazy. There's a, a number distribution, uh, like how many ones, how many twos, how many threes, how many fours, that actually occurs naturally. And you can actually tell if someone actually just like makes up random numbers, um, I, not with 100% certainty, but you can get kind of a sense of like, this actually don't look like they actually came about in the natural world. Um, and so there's all sorts of really cool stuff going on. And so there's this movement to open up um, uh, because there's been just been outrageous um, instances in the past of particularly big pharma and some of the kind of medical instrument companies that make like, you know, like uh, the, the, you know, uh, artificial hips and things like that, um, uh, that, that have, uh, uh, you know, have hidden things that were. Uh, not great for their um, that not great for the patients, not great for the stockholders. Um, but uh, you know, so anyway, good for the stockholders is actually bad for the patients. Great, thank you for that answer. So caloric restriction has uh, become very popular. Like uh, Longo has done, uh, you know, research on the power of uh, caloric restriction with regard to health and longevity. To the extent that that is true. Um, are the dietary recommendations for calories you know, accurate, like 2,000 calories a day for the average size person? Oh, so it's interesting. So caloric restriction, I have a whole chapter of it on it in the How Not to Diet book. And I have a chapter on it in my upcoming book, How Not to Age on Longevity, which will be out in December. Um, so I'm really kind of steeped in this literature. There's very, uh, so first of all, just to take a step back, uh, people are all excited about caloric restriction because, you know, we have about a century of data suggesting that, for example, if you calorie restrict a rat, you can get as much as a 50% increase in uh, in average lifespan. Um, but it turns out that um, a minority of animals actually, I mean, so that there's this sense that calorie restriction extends the life of all animals. Completely not true. About 80% of animals doesn't work at all. And in rodents even. So, for example, mice, they looked at the dozens of strains of mice. Uh, caloric, caloric restriction shortened the lives of three times as many that actually improved. Most actually didn't do anything to their lifespan, uh, but I think it improved like five, but then um, shortened the lives of 15. So if you can't even extrapolate from one strain of mice to another strain of mice, to extrapolate to people is a little pushing. In fact, and some uh, some strains, it uh, extended the lives of female mice and it's in the same uh, you know, uh, decrease the lives of male male mice at the, at the same strain. Anyway, so the data for anyone who actually takes an objective look is conflicted all over the place. We're not mice um, and on and on. And I mean, the entire field is really uh, the fundamental problem is that the control group typically ad libitum diets, meaning you can eat as much as you want. Anyone who has a pet knows that if you let your animal eat as much as they want, what happens? They get fat. Um, and what happens when they get fat? Then they suffer from obesity-related disease, including shortened lifespan. So whether or not caloric restriction is actually extending lives or just preventing the life-shortening effects of obesity um, is a completely different question. So, um, so look, there's a lot of fat people. In fact, 74% uh, of Americans are overweight or obese, or obese right now. Um, and so in that sense, you could extrapolate. Yeah, we all, I mean, most of us really do need to caloric restrict, but someone healthy weight, caloric restricting is actually going to make them live longer. Even the, even the rodent data, the best data is questionable on that fact. I could go on and on and on. Anyway, um, uh, the mo I, I think the cr most critical piece to take home is that most, if not all of the benefits of caloric restriction actually come from protein restriction. So um, if you, uh, if you uh, just restrict protein, you can get the same kind of life ex extension or um, without restriction of calories at all, um, or you can restrict calories, but keep protein the same and you don't get the benefit 
of caloric restriction. So really maybe all about restricting protein and not just all protein specific proteins, particularly methionine um, and some of the branch chain amino acids. And so thankfully we can all, that's a lot easier rather than starving ourselves. We can bring our pro, total protein intake down to recommended levels, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And we can shift from animal sources of protein to plant protein sources, which will um, move over, kind of shift the amino acid profile in a more longevity promoting direction. Great. Thank you so much. So given what you just said about uh, caloric restriction and, and the results being at best uh, um, confusing, um, how does that jive with the benefits in fasting, which I guess is the ultimate form of caloric restriction? Um, yeah, so I have a whole series of about 26 videos on fasting, um, a very popular uh, video series. I did a webinar on it um, and uh, have lots. In fact, that's the biggest chapter in How Not to Diet. We talk about intermittent fasting, water only fasting, 5-2 fasting, fasting mimicking diets, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I mean, I kind of dive deep in the literature, talk about the pros and cons of all the different types. And basically, kind of the bottom line, spoiler alert, is early time restricted feeding. Um, is um, remarkably beneficial. So we should try to restrict our eat daily eating window to 12 hours or less, but critically, it should be early rather than late. If we skip any meal, we're skipping supper, not breakfast. Ideally, we should shove our most of our caloric intake as early in the day as possible. Great. I just shifted my window to uh, to be exactly that based on your book. Oh, fantastic. So um, Changing to curcumin, a lot of our speakers have mentioned the power of curcumin as as if it's you know some really you know amazing uh, spice you know or element I guess of of, of turmeric. Um, what what does the research show uh, of the power of of curcumin? Should we just have uh, term you know turmeric or um, should we go for some sort of uh, a curcumin um, supplement? Yeah, so I've got lots of videos on both curcumin and turmeric. The reason you hear so many people pushing curcumin is because you can actually make some money selling curcumin. You can't make money selling turmeric, right? It's just dirt cheap, um, you know, a few pennies a day uh, for a daily dose. Um, but many of the benefits that ascribe to, to, to curcumin may actually be non-curcumin, so-called curcuminoids. Um, and so you can do these studies um, showing that you can get similar effects with curcumin free turmeric meaning you extract the curcumin now throw it away and you think well if that's the active ingredient you should, it should be nothing right no you can actually sometimes even get better effects um uh uh and so uh I, you know i encourage people to kind of uh in general uh try to eat things as nature intended as grown food as grown um in its whole form um and there are indeed studies showing that just plain regular turmeric in kind of culinary doses um, can have remarkable uh, benefits. It is the single most anti-inflammatory food found the dietary inflammatory index. Um, there is no food on the planet that's been shown um, in these randomized controlled trials to have more of an anti-inflammatory effect. So I encourage people to actually include it every day. It's part of my daily dozen, one of the daily dozen of my healthiest of healthy foods to include into your daily life includes a quarter teaspoon of turmeric a day. If you don't like the taste, then um, you can either put it into capsules or you can buy pre, just pre-made capsules. But again, I encourage people not to get curcumin extract supplements, but just straight one ingredient, turmeric, period, no fillers, no nothing. Great. Thank you. In one of your videos, you talked about replacing salt with potassium chloride. Some yeah. of the speakers recommended avoiding potassium chloride. What does the research show? Uh, why was someone uh, down on potassium chloride? Was there a reason given? Uh, something about it not being natural. Um, and what do you mean? It's as natural as sodium chloride. It's just a, a mineral that's mined from the earth, just like salt is. Yeah, no, potassium chloride. So the so uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of disease risk factors on planet Earth, um, uh, the, uh, funded by the Mill and Melinda Gates Foundation, found that the number one dietary risk factor for death on the planet, the single worst thing about the human diet, is it soda, is it processed meat? no. Excess sodium intake kills more people than anything else that we eat. Um, and so if there was one thing to do about our diet, first, it would be to reduce our salt intake. And one of the ways we can do that without sacrificing taste is by shifting over to potassium chloride. Um, and so we actually tend to be deficient in potassium. 98% uh, of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of 4,700 milligrams of potassium. Uh, most of us get way too much sodium. 
Um, and so, hey, this is better. We, we cut out the sodium, get the potassium, uh, has the same kind of salty taste. Ta-da! Okay, what's the what's the downside? Well, I mean, so the reason this isn't used everywhere, like this isn't like, you know, I mean, just like, why doesn't all the manufacturers and restaurants just switch over to it? Is um, you, if you have uh, dysfunctional kidneys, if your kidneys aren't working well, then you can build up too much potassium in your blood. Normally, um, your potassium, your, your kidneys just wash off any extra potassium. Um, in fact, we probably evolved getting an excess of 10,000 milligrams, massive amounts of potassium every day. No problem. Our kidneys just wash it out. They're used to that. But let's say you have kidney function, a kidney dysfunction. Um, then you can build up dangerous levels of potassium in the bloodstream and, and have a problem. So if you're diabetic, if you're elderly, um, if you have anything that might suggest you might have inadequate kidney function, before you make that switch to potassium chloride, I really would like you get your kidney function tested. You can do that very easily um, uh, with your with your medical professional, and just make sure because you know kidney neuro um, nephropathy is you know rife among diabetics and a certain age. Some people's kidney function starts to decline. Or more if you have kidney issues, you know you have kidney issues. Um, you want to make sure um, uh, you can handle it. Ironically, even people with kidney dysfunction actually made longer live longer switching to potassium chloride, even though there's a risk of excess potassium just because um, so sodium is so damaging uh, to the kidneys. But that's something you want to talk to your doctor about. Thank you. For people eating a whole food plant-based diet, do you recommend avoiding oils and how about other fats? You know, there's a, there's talk, you know, what, you know, what's a healthy fat and should we be eating them at high levels, you know, on a plant-based diet? What are your thoughts on that? And what is, what is yeah. the reaction? Most right. I mean, if they're eating a whole food plant-based diet, then they're not eating oils, right? Because they're not whole foods. Instead of eating walnut oil, want to eat walnuts. Instead of eating flaxseed oil, want to eat some flaxseeds and get all the other nutrients in there, right? Oil is the kind of table sugar of the fat kingdom, right? You take something like a sugar beet, super healthy, which is where most sugar comes from these days. You remove all the nutrition, all the fiber, all the vitamins and minerals, you're left with table sugar, right? And same thing. You take a walnut, you remove all the nutrition, you know, all the vitamins, minerals, except a few fat soluble uh, uh, vitamins left. Um, but basically, you just strip all that nutrition away. Why would you do that? And you end up with this incredibly calorically dense food, probably the most calorically dense um, substance on the planet. Even butter has fewer calories because it has a little water in it, 120 calories per tablespoon. Um, uh, and essentially, these are empty calories. Why not get it from whole food sources? Now, I'm all in favor of eating healthy sources of fat. Um, just like I'm all in favor of eating healthy sources of carbohydrates, healthy sources of protein. Um, and so where do we get uh, you? So, you know, avocados and nuts and seeds, nut butters, seed butters. These are fantastic, um, healthy foods, but again, in the whole form, if at all possible. Thank you. So, um, changing to diabetes, uh, there, you know, we had, um, uh, Dr. Neil Bernard on, uh, and he talked about, obviously you sound like you look like you're a fan. Uh, we, we love Neil. So who doesn't love Neil? Exactly. So, um, you know, he talks about how fat is really the, the cause of, of diabetes. Um, and obviously the, the, the general um, idea out in public is that it's sugar. What does the research show? Yeah, it's actually not just fat in general, but specifically saturated fat. Um, saturated fat causes insulin resistance, which is the cause of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. And so we can we can cure, we can treat the cause and sometimes even reverse the disease by pulling out saturated fat from our muscles and liver. We do that in two ways. One, stop it going into our mouths. Saturated fat mostly found in uh, meat, dairy, and junk. Um, and or number two, we may have uh, fat you know, stuck around our middle and so require weight loss. And that's dumping into our bloodstream, even if we're not eating any. So but weight loss, particularly that uh, visceral fat, that, um, uh, that kind of deep belly fat, between reducing deep belly fat, reducing saturated fat intake, you can um, prevent uh, type 2 diabetes uh, um, and work on arresting and potentially even reversing, if you, particularly if you catch it early enough. Great. And all right, one more question before I turn it over to the audience. So um, uh, now the, the, I know your, your um, thoughts on the keto diet. You're not a big fan of the keto diet. Why is, you know, why are those diets keep on showing up? Why are they so popular? Why are these books constantly written about them? Thoughts on that? Not I'm not a fan. Science isn't a fan of the keto diet. 
right? No, no. Why? Why do they keep showing up? Because people love, this is a McDougal line, right? People love to hear bad news, good news about their bad habits, right? Who doesn't want a book that says eat bacon and butter and, right? I mean, who's going to sell more copies? Some with a steak on the cover or something with broccoli on the cover, right? I mean, it's just simple math here. Um, and so people want, love to hear that kind of news, but unfortunately, um, you know, and so I have a whole chapter on it and how not to diet, obviously. Turns out when you switch to a ketogenic diet, your uh, fat loss actually slows down. The reason it continues to be so popular because the scale, on, oh, as I just talked about, right? The mm -hmm. scale makes it look fantastic, right? You lose all this water weight, you see your body starts cannibalizing its own protein. So you're losing lean mass, looks great on the scale, but you're actually <laughs> losing less um, body fat. And then if you had just, um, uh, uh, continue to eat non-keto. Same thing with water-only fasting, actually. Looks great on the scale. Actually slows down body fat loss because your body switches over to protein. Thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, have our first uh, um, participant from the audience ask a question. Steve, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, Steve from New York. Dr. Gregor. Hey, Steve. My mom was Brooklyn. Dad was Queens. Where are you uh, in New York? Rockaway Beach. Nice. Kudos to you. Blessings. Thanks. All the best. Two questions. I'm one of Dr. Goldner's smoothie shredders, recovered oh. from Hashimoto's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Whoa. But when I hear you talking about wool off your calories, is my Vitamix messing with my cell walls? First question. Second question. Appreciate the deep dive. You just, hey, I'm trying to go fast because of you, you know? Um, Appreciate the deep dive you just did on allulose, but oh, you but neat, you yeah. didn't you didn't cover uh, the problems that uh, like the other um, uh, uh, sugars. Is there a, a expectation of sweet calories coming, and does the body adjust uh, by decreasing metabolism or decreasing activity or giving us more hunger, so that at the end of the day there is no benefit from this special sugar and we're eating the same calories as we would without the allulose. Fantastic question. question. Yeah, great questions. Okay, so um, the Vitamix is breaking open all those cells. Well, also it matters what you're actually blending. If you're blending greens, that's a good thing. Why? Because we are, uh, because we're getting at all that nutrition that no matter how well we chew our kale, we're never going to get that. So green smoothie is a great way to uh, to maximize our nutrition from the most single nutritious food on the planet in terms of nutrients per calorie, um, dark green leafy vegetables. Um, the uh, the wall off your calories is particularly important for um, a whole grain because our these our our bugs are are uh, are starch feeders, uh, fiber feeders. Of course, nothing happens to the fiber in the vibe mix, but um, you know. But, but if you blend up, I don't know if you make some like. You know, you, blend, you take oat groats and you blend into oat flour in your Vitamix uh, to make some kind of muffin um, thing or something, then uh, you are uh, really robbing your good gut bugs of all that, um, of all the, that goodies that you would normally get if you would just um, chewed on oat groats. Um, and in terms of allulose, yeah, these so-called rare sugars, um, uh, there's not enough safety data to uh, give a green light to them. And of course, uh, we have the erythritol story, um, uh, which is not a rare sugar, but a sugar alcohol, where we thought it was harmless. And then um, uh, we, we, we realized that uh, that's probably not the case. And so a big red light to erythritol, making us even more sensitive to the lack of safety data for the rare sugars. But you, give a, you bring up a good point about any kind of um, uh, kind of low calorie and non caloric sweetener. Uh, but the you know, there's a mismatch in the brain between um, the sweetness that's tasted on the tongue, and the amount of calories your body, your brain uh, recognizes going into your system when you drink like a diet soda or something. Um, and so normally your brain is very good about oh, it tastes this sweet, I'm going to get this many calories. And then all of a sudden, it takes just as sweet, but all of a sudden, no calories. And so the brain's like, whoa, here all along, I was thinking sweet calories, but actually, it's sweet calories. So boy, I have to kind of ramp up my appetite to, uh, to because I thought I was getting this many calories. I think I'm only getting this many calories. I got to ramp up my appetite for sweetness. 
Um, and so you actually end up, so if you have a diet soda in the morning compared to regular soda, you actually eat more at lunch after having a diet soda, even though they're, you know, kind of just as sweet. Um, um, and such that you don't do yourself any favors in terms of weight loss, in terms of blood sugars. Um, and so, uh, so what should we do? What we should do is we should get our sweetness from whole foods whenever possible, eating sweet potatoes and fresh fruit, dried fruit. Um, um, uh, uh, date sugar is probably the best sweetener for like baked goods, which is just dried pulverized dates. It's actually a whole food. Um, uh, and for, in terms of a sweetener for like drinks, because date sugar has fiber, so it gets kind of clumpy. Um, I would suggest probably date syrup. Um, even though it's really not a whole food, they extract some of the fiber. But if you look at the date syrups, try to find one with at least like hmm, three grams of fiber per serving, or the more the, the you buy the one with the most fiber per serving, which is kind of a proxy for how unprocessed it is. Or even better, make your own. I have a recipe in my How Not to Die cookbook on making your own date syrup, and you make absolutely sure it's a whole food. Thank you for that, doctor. Our next question is coming from David. David, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, doctor. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Massachusetts, and you're also my hero. I, I can tell you that I turned to a plant-based diet about five years ago, thanks to your videos and websites. So thank you very much for this. Um, I have uh, two questions. One, if if a, if, uh, if a plant-based diet person has... Um, um, insufficient omega-3 in a blood test, although he eats, you know, um, nuts and seeds and, you know, uh, also grind uh, black seeds, how would you recommend to increase the omega-3 level? And my next question related to this, uh, many speakers said that uh, um, heated uh, nut or roasted nuts and seeds can be carcinogen. What, what is your uh, uh, thought about this? Thank you again. Oh, fantastic questions. What a great crowd. Good questions. Um, okay. So in terms of uh, long chain omega-3s like DHA, EPA, your body can make those long chain omega-3s from the short chain plant omega-3s, ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, found in concentrated in flax seeds and hemp seeds and walnuts. Um, and so first of all, you have to get enough. Sounds like you are. Um, at least a tablespoon of ground flax seeds a day um, is my recommendation in the daily dozen. Okay, but that's not enough because your body... It has to then elongate um, the ALA and the flax into those long chain uh, fatty acids. And the same series of enzymes that does that task also elongates omega-6 uh, fatty acids. So if you eat a lot of junky oil, like corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, um, and you kind of overwhelm your system with omega-6s, those enzymes get all tied up and can't elongate your omega-3. So um, presumably if you're with it enough to be like, I'm eating my ground flax seeds, you're not eating a lot of junk food, which is where these kind of junky oil, omega-6 rich oils are. And so um, uh, then I would uh, encourage you to consider taking a preformed source of long chain omega-3s, um, such as a, a DHA um, a capsule, 250 milligrams from, an, from a pollutant-free source. So for example, they make from algae, yeast, um, and uh, this is not so much for heart health, um, but for cognitive health, particularly later in life. So I want to ask a follow-up question. Um, one of our speakers had mentioned about flaxseed. Oh, sorry, uh, the nuts, uh, the roasted nuts. I'm sorry. Uh, let me just get the roast. Absolutely. We should try to stick to raw nuts and seeds, raw and unseed butters um, because of the AGs, the advanced glycation end products. When we expose kind of uh, high fat, high protein foods to certain temperatures, these um, AGs are formed. They're not good for us. Um, but it's important to kind of keep everything in context. So I actually have a video coming out talking about this very issue. And yes, you know, uh, you know, roasted almonds have you know much more than raw almonds, but even roasted almonds have nowhere close to um, the, the key sources, um, the most concentrated source of AGs, which is um, uh, meat, uh, particularly chicken, um, so, you know, baked, broiled, boil, uh, baked, broiled, barbecued, grilled uh, chicken, also bacon and, and, uh, and other meats. Um, and so you don't put it in perspective. It's not like you're, you're getting the kind of AGE load you get 
in kind of a typical fast food meal or something, but we should really try to decrease our um, intake as much as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I used to toast my walnuts because I love toasting walnuts, um, but now I've switched to uh, to raw and you can get raw almond butter, et cetera. Uh, all right. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. No That's- worries. One of, our, one of our speakers had said of the pre-ground flax meal that it's not a good idea because you lose nutrients and she recommended buying whole flax meal and then grinding yourself and using it right away. What does the research show on that? Yeah, so that may, that makes total sense kind of intuitively, but when actually put to the test, remarkable preservation of uh, nutrition um, and no oxidation kept an air container even six months, six months at room temperature. So ground flax seed six months later, uh, it has to be airtight container um, and, and still fine, which is really surprising because- um, omega threes are very sensitive to oxidation. That's why you know flaxseed oil goes rancid um, very quickly. But when it's sur- when it's in the whole food form, even when it's ground up, it's surrounded by things that the plant makes to protect those omega threes, like all those antioxidants, and keeps it fresh. So you don't need to grind your own. You're ter- totally welcome to. It's probably cheaper to do it that way. Um, but for convenience' sake, you can just pre- get pre ground. Great. Thank you. And we've got one more question here. Um, This is coming from Lisa. Lisa, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I'm from Jackson, Tennessee. Hi, Dr. Gregor. Hello. My question is, are there any foods that you know of that can slow down the replication of viruses, viruses like Epstein-Barr, herpes, CMV, et cetera? Thank you. Oh, it's a fantastic question. There are Indeed, um, uh, foods have been found to uh, decrease uh, viral replication. Now, it's possible that it actually isn't an effect on the virus itself, but rather on our immune system, boosting our immune system such that, but the end result is lower viral load um, and, uh, and viral symptoms. So, for example, broccoli sprouts is kind of the classic example with influenza virus. You can drip flu into people's nose. Um, and uh, and have them eat broccoli sprouts and get significantly lower uh, viral loads, significantly less virus-induced inflammation. Um, uh, we, and we think it's that sulforaphane, that wonderful cruciferous vegetable compound. One of the reasons why my daily dozen cruciferous vegetables every day, not just vegetables every day, but specifically cruciferous vegetables, which is kale, collard, broccoli, um, cabbage, cauliflower, etc. Okay, um, another one specifically for um, the herpes viruses. Um, uh is uh uh what is it it's the uh the seaweed that's used to make seaweed salad uh it's not rma well isn't it wakimi or something like that waki oh oh uh, wakame yes yes absolutely um yeah so uh and so uh that's one of the reasons i put it in my soups um uh is uh, because of its antiviral properties again it may not be an antiviral property it may actually be an immune boosting pro- property but the end result is an antiviral properly property whether it's attacking the virus directly or helping us uh, deal with it so uh if you're interested you can type in wakame w-a-k-a-m-e or epstein bar into nutritionfacts.org and that video um will pop right up great well with that i believe we're out of time so thank you ah. Unless you want to do more. No, no, I'm no, you're (laughs) absolutely right. I got to go. I have a a webinar coming up. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Fantastic questions. Um, uh, And uh, thanks so much for having me on. I would like to just real quickly, uh, if we can unmute and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.